don't mind that weird old man over there. Hello, I would like one order of bad green screen, please. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Kyle C. Sullivan, this is the Black Pants Film School, and this is our first VFX breakdown video. Basically what I'd like to do with this part of the series is break down some of our older sketches and the effects that we did in those without any money. And then I also plan on learning how to do some new things myself for the sake of some upcoming videos. So I'm going to be doing things like trying to remake some of our older effects with the knowledge and skills and resources that I have now. But first I want to talk about a really important aspect of visual effects work and really any work and possibly life. I've mentioned this before in past videos is something that I call the rule of diminishing returns. As an example, let's use a cornerstone of all visual compositing, which is keying. The first step to separating green screen footage into its own transparent element is to select the color that you want to be transparent. Basically, you're pointing out the green in the background and telling the computer anything that is this color, I want it to be transparent. Stick a picture in the background and boom, suddenly you're standing in front of Area 51 instead of your office. At this point, if the goal is to put yourself in a different location with the green screen, you are 90% of the way done. It might not look perfect, but it's a pretty stark difference between those two images. But we want it to look a little bit better, so we're going to put in some more work. Basically, what we want to end up with in any keying scenario is a good alpha mat. We're going to use the key light settings to increase the contrast between those whites and blacks to make sure that everything we want visible is solid white and everything that we want completely gone is black. And then what I do is use that alpha mat and then apply it to a modified copy of that same footage where I turn any instance of the green to just gray. The point of that is to get rid of some of the green edge that you sometimes get on a green screen if it's not set up properly and if some of the green from the background is splashing onto your subject. Additionally, I'm going to add a couple extra effects that help clean up the sharpness of the mat and even add a little little bit more of a natural motion blur to it. So now, side by side, this one definitely looks better. However, there was objectively less progress made between images 2 and 3 than there was between 1 and 2. It was a much bigger jump in that first step than it was in the second step of fine-tuning it and making it look prettier. Despite that, the second step took more time, probably about double the amount that the first step did at least. After this, I would usually apply an edge light to the subject as well. In my green screen composition, I go down to the mask layer, I duplicate it twice, and then I set the top mask layer to be a luminance matte for the bottom one, meaning we only get this edge of white. I then blur the mask itself so that that edge becomes feathered and then I combine both of those into their own separate composition. I then copy the background into the green screen comp and then use the edge light luminance mat that I just made to only display a little bit of the background fading in around the edge of my subject. Set the background to screen so that it looks more like a glow and then adjust the opacity so that it's not too intense. Looking back at our original composition you can see that the edge of me kind of blends into the scene a little bit better because some of the scene looks like it's being reflected onto me. It's subtle, it makes it look a little bit better, but it definitely takes a lot more work. This is the law of diminishing returns in action. Basically, as you put more and more work into something, you're going to get progressively less out of each subsequent step. And it gets to a certain point where you have to ask yourself, is it worth putting in more time to fine tune this effect further when maybe I could be using that time to start on another effect, which again, I can get 90% of the way there in 10 seconds. Sometimes it's absolutely worth putting in that little bit of extra work to get that level of polish that we're used to seeing in theaters because it can make a difference between an effect looking pretty good or looking real and actually like tricking people, which is sort of the goal. But time management is a really big part of filmmaking and sometimes you have to get a sketch out on Monday and so you have to be able to balance the amount of work you put into one effect versus other effects versus the sound or any other aspect of the video that also has to be done at the same time. And at the end of the day, no matter how much work you put into a single effect, it still won't change the fact that maybe you could have shot the footage a little bit better. Honestly, half the battle for or making realistic visual effects is knowing exactly what you want to be your final product and how to achieve it before you ever even set foot on set. Pre-planning and preparation are absolutely the number one priority when doing visual effects. Fixing it in post is not impossible but is honestly really difficult to do because if you weren't planning it 
out, then something isn't going to match up. I actually have an entire video on that situation. I released it a few years ago as part of our 10K week. I'll link that in the description if you're interested in checking it out. But to see an example of all this stuff in action, let's take a look at our video D&D The Tavern. I was very excited about doing this video because I had watched a whole bunch of behind the scenes stuff on the Lord of the Rings movies. Unfortunately, I wasn't really able to try all of those creative methods because they involved a lot of money and construction that I didn't have time for. But I didn't just want to take a green screen element of Ethan shrink him down and then stick him into the scene kind of off to the side. That's basically just the split screen effect. It's one of the easiest effects to accomplish and we use it in our videos all the time. Even just to duplicate props that we couldn't afford more than one of. Sometimes we use it just to take the microphone out of the scene because there wasn't any other way to get it right in front of the actor's face. I didn't want to just do that same exact trick for this one because it's really easy to see when it's being used. So we planned out some ways for Ethan to interact with pieces of the environment that the full-size actors were also interacting with. So for example, this first scene of the party walking into the bar, I wanted it to actually feel like different sized people were approaching the same surface. We started with a shot of Allison and Porik just walking up to the camera without any kind of bar or Ethan in the shot at all. We then got a shot of Ethan covering about double the distance that our other two actors did, all in front of a green screen and approaching an actual wooden surface. The height that we wanted it to be on his character, which is much higher than it would be on the other two actors. As a nice little cherry on top, we also made those actors approach the bar so that we got their reflections in the wood. I cut Ethan out of the green screen, masked around the other footage, and then I lined up the pieces of the bar so that they matched the portion Ethan was leaning against and also had the reflections of the actors as they walked up. Thankfully, the table reflections were really low detail, so they didn't have to be exactly right. In another shot, we have the party sitting at a table and water being delivered to them. This shot was entirely in there because I really wanted to have Ethan pick up something that one of the other characters had already touched. Rachel sets the glasses down, Ethan reaches for one, picks it up. If you look closely though, it's a different glass that he picks up because the two glasses weren't exactly identical. The trick here was using Porik's arm to mask the change from one glass to another. We had a base clip of Porik at the table and Rachel dropping off the glasses. Then we had another shot where we placed the bigger glass a proportionate distance away from Ethan and sat him in front of a green screen. He reached for the glass, did his whole action, and then we cut him out, resized it, and inserted it, blending the top of his table in with the rest of the table, masking out Pork's arm by hand, and then using the frame where it completely obscured the glass to change from one piece of footage to the other. I also timed the actor's actions very specifically so that Ethan is already reaching for the glass before it changes. With all these different parts moving out of sync, it's much less obvious the exact point at which the glass changes over, and you're less likely to notice just casually watching it through. Looking back on it, I think the only thing that would have made it better is if I could have found an exact replica, like scale model of that glass, because then there would be no way to tell that it was a different cup. But that was just one of those things that we just kind of had to decide wasn't worth putting the time into because it was close enough. Our last big group shot was everybody approaching the old man and then eventually taking the map that he gives them. You'll notice that Ethan is alone on his side of the table so that I don't have to deal with him overlapping with anyone else because that would involve a whole lot of rotoscoping and nobody wants to do that. He basically just walked on his knees in front of the green screen so that he was correctly level with the table, and we just had two different copies of the map prop, one regular size one that the old man sets down, and one really big one that Ethan grabs when he walks off. Another thing I had to add in this shot was a shadow, because Ethan wasn't actually casting a shadow on the wall, the screen was blocking it. All I did was copy his footage, turn it completely black by lowering the luminance value, I then made a copy of that layer and then used three-dimensional positioning built into After Effects to align it with the two walls. That way it would accurately be cast on the corner of the room. I blurred it, lowered the opacity, and it actually made a really convincing shadow, especially with all the other strong shadows in the scene as reference. The rest of selling Ethan's and Jeffrey's size, for that matter, was just creative camera angles and the close-ups, and making sure everybody's eye lines were pointing in the right direction. A little bit of convincing acting goes a long way, by which I mean looking up. There you have it. That's how you make a Hobbit. If we had gone in there without having planned any of that stuff ahead of time, it would not turned out nearly as good. The fact that Ethan is touching things and moving things and casting shadows, all those little details make it feel like he's actually existing in that same world, and it's really hard to 
make that look right if you just kind of show up, get him in front of a green screen, get the other footage separate, and then hope that you can get everything done later on. And that's pretty much all I have for today. I have an entire list of other videos I want to get through that I've been kind of compiling into different categories. If there's any specific video that you want to see a VFX breakdown on, let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching, I will see you next week, and I will now fly backward into space as this video ends. Bye! Hi there, I'm Kyle from Two Weeks Later, and I'm here to tell you about our store on DFTBA.com. We have a lot of cool stuff over there and a lot of cool stuff that we want to add to it, but we can't yet because we haven't actually sold enough of the original stuff to break even because I don't ever advertise anything, but I'm gonna start now, so here we go. We've got lapel pins, we've got vinyl stickers, we've got campaign buttons about crabs and whales so you can tell everybody exactly how you feel about the big issues. We also have this authentic book of boat made from genuine Bible skin and including this very nice uh, golden logo and a uh, black ribbon bookmark so you know it's the real deal. It's also completely empty on the inside, which means you can fill it with whatever you want, ensuring sense centuries of theological conflict once these are all found in the collapsed rubble of our civilization. If you enjoy our videos and you'd like to help us make some more, you can also go on over to patreon.com slash doormonster. For your monthly donation, you'll be able to get several cool community perks, such as your name on the end plate of these videos, which I actually forgot to do the last couple of times, but I won't this time because I just called myself out. All Patreon donations go directly back into the channel so that we can do things like get Ethan back here so that he can do these Patreon advertisements as God intended. Anyway, I'll let you get back to whatever the hell's going on here. Bye.